Lisa Benton Short, Professor of Geography at George Washington University, located in the center of our nation's capital. I'm an urban geographer and I've studied cities for many years. And while you can learn a lot from reading and researching cities, it's hard to appreciate all that's happening in a city from sitting in front of your desk. So you've got to get out there and explore. And that's why we're going to take an urban field trip together. This isn't a field trip like a typical tourist would do because we're not gonna walk around uninformed or trying to guess at what we're looking at. As you know, geography has a rich tradition of field work. And field work involves visiting places, reading and researching about these places in order to develop a better understanding of what's happening. So on this field trip, I'm gonna to introduce to you some of the key concepts from the urban unit and show you how they're visible in the urban landscape. So just to get you oriented on where, where we're going, this is Washington DC in relation to the mid-Atlantic region of the United States. You can see Baltimore and Philadelphia are to our north. And Washington DC is oftentimes very visible on maps because it has this wonderful partially completed diamond shape to it, um, stretching 10 miles by 10 miles. But our field trip today is gonna to focus mostly on the downtown and the eight stops that we're going to make. Before we get going, I just wanna point out that GW is just a few blocks um, west of the White House. And so we really are front and center in our nation's capital. So our first, our first stop is going to be at the US Capitol where I'll introduce the concept of the cultural landscape. Then we move a few hundred yards to the west and I'll talk about the National Mall as one of our most important public spaces. Next up, I'll probably be hungry by then, so I'm going to stop in front of a, uh, several food trucks and talk about the acculturation of food and the role of immigrant entrepreneurs. The next stop is a tiny overlooked column called the Jefferson Pier, and I'm going to share an interesting fact about cartography and map making um, way back in the early Republic. Then it's on to the White House, where I'm going to scrutinize the growing security measures that include bollards, barriers, and bunkers. After that, we're going to go just a bit to the north of the White House in the newly named Black Lives Matter Plaza, where I'll discuss the importance of social protest and the lasting legacy of inequality in US cities. Then we'll continue north a few more blocks to DuPont Circle and examine the idea of sense of place. And finally, I'm gonna end the tour at the Navy Yard. That's where I live. Um, and the Navy Yard is a great spot to end because it's where waterfront development has transformed this area into one of the most interesting neighborhoods in the city. So let's get going. All right, so I'm starting my tour here at the symbolic heart of Washington, D.C., the Capitol Building. Inside the Capitol, you'll find the Senate and House of Representatives. They come together to discuss, debate, deliberate national policy, develop consensus, and craft our nation's laws. So the Capitol behind me is a fine example of 19th century neoclassical architecture. Its design harkens back to ancient Greece and Rome, to evoke those democratic ideals that helped guide some of the earliest architecture in Washington, DC. So the Capitol sits atop the highest hill in the downtown area. It looks westward um, towards the US Capitol reflecting pool onto the Washington Monument about a mile and a half away and all the way to the western banks of the Potomac River where the Lincoln Memorial sits about 2.2 miles away. As our nation has evolved, so too has this U.S. Capitol. Today, the building covers more than 1.5 million square feet and has over 600 rooms and miles of corridor. It's crowned by this magnificent white dome that overlooks the city of Washington. And it's one of the reasons why this building has become a widely recognized symbol of the American people and of democracy. This is what geographers call a cultural landscape. Cultural landscape is a place where meaning is imbued in the buildings and in the grounds and in the architecture and the landscape. And the message of the US Capitol is, this is where democracy happens. This is where we actually practice democracy on a day-to-day -day basis. So the Capitol isn't just a collection of stones and concrete and steel. It's far more powerful and meaningful to Americans as a symbol of democracy. 
The National Mall has become the place for national commemoration. Many memorials on the mall are a visible expression of the right to freedom of speech. Every memorial has a message and an intended audience. And this is what geographers oftentimes refer to as a cultural landscape. The mall has become the physical representation of American history and national identity. And most of the structures, the statues, and even the landscape carry this message. I was right here in January of 2017 when I attended the Women's March on Washington. The crowd was, I don't know, at least a half a million people. Millions more marched in the hundreds of other cities in the U.S. and around the world. They marched in the streets. They marched to protest uh, women's issues. They marched to important public spaces like city halls or city parks. They marched on the mall to show that their presence was too great to ignore. They were demanding to be heard, and this represents the power of public space and protests in public space. As an urban geographer, I study the important role of public spaces in cities, and perhaps no public space is more important in America than the National Mall. Its monuments, memorial, and stage events contribute to a larger story about who we are as Americans, about our national identity, reflecting the meanings of democracy, freedom, and citizenship. So the National Mall is a place that enshrines First Amendment rights, and it symbolizes the values of America. For more than 100 years, people have come here to protest our government, to push us to understand what we mean by equality, citizenship, democracy, the mall, like the Capitol building, is a cultural landscape shaped over many years with monuments and memorials that add to and tell a story about this country. The National Mall in Washington, D.C. has been called America's front yard and a stage for democracy. It stretches more than two miles end to end, starting at the U.S. Capitol, west all the way to the Lincoln. And the Washington Monument behind me is right in the middle of the mall. Each year, more than 25 million people visit the mall to take in its memorials and its monuments and its museums. So the mall is a place where we inaugurate presidents and where the country commemorates leaders like George Washington and Abraham Lincoln. It's also a place where protests and demonstrations like those led by Martin Luther King in 1963 challenge us to rethink what constitutes citizenship, justice, and democracy. So the mall is now ordinary public space. It's actually an active agent in the telling of our national story. So I'm standing here at a gathering of food trucks. There are many of the food trucks are pretty recent on city streets in the last 10 years, but in that short time, they become incredibly popular. There are even television shows that feature food truck competitions. So today's food trucks offer menus from cupcakes to grilled cheese sandwiches to hybrid taco waffles and pretty much anything imaginable. There's actually a long history of street side food in cities. This began hundreds of years ago when many people didn't have the resources to cook their own meals and vendors sold food from small carts or street kitchens and the practice has continued. Historically, food trucks were associated with quick and easy to prepare food such as hot dogs. In the US, one food truck that was really popular was the Wienermobile. It was created in 1936. Of course, it was made to advertise, what else, Oscar Mayer Wieners. Wienermobile toured the United States selling hot dogs that pulled up at schools and orphanages, parades, and hospitals. Another era in food truck innovation occurred in the 1960s with Mexican loncheras. Um, these were food trucks set up to provide lunches for immigrant workers working construction or agriculture. The next era in food trucks really occurred in 2008 after the recession. Chefs from top restaurants were being laid off and few restaurants were hiring. Many who wanted to start a restaurant opted instead to open up a food truck because, well, it's less expensive and didn't require the large loan like a traditional restaurant. So food truck owners can avoid those high costs of real estate and the burden of staying open all day and they can design their own hours to match food traffic. So today in many cities across the US and beyond, food trucks are operated by a diversity of entrepreneurs. As you know, many immigrants come to cities because that's where the job opportunities are. So for many immigrants, the low start cost, startup costs of owning a food truck offers greater opportunity than other professions. Um, and uh, for many food owners, it's also a way for their chance at the American dream. The streets of DC have food trucks that offer an incredible diversity of food from Indonesian noodles 
to pad thai to Indian dosas and Peruvian empanadas. The world has come to our city streets in the form of food trucks. Today, it's estimated there's 23,000 food trucks in the U.S. doing about a billion dollars worth of business annually. So I think food trucks will be here for a long time. So I'm actually sitting on the ground here at the Jefferson Pier, this little concrete pillar behind me. It's also called the Jefferson Marker. It's small and somewhat hidden and you have to look hard to find it. Most visitors to the National Mall pass by it without even noticing it or stopping. So this is where geographers love to geek out. This is a wonderful artifact here in Washington, D.C. So, in the early years of the American Republic, some leaders briefly pushed for the location of the navigational meridian to pass through central Washington, D.C. So remember, this was a time before the international prime meridian at Greenwich was established, and so many countries based their maps off of the prime meridian passing through their capital cities. Then uh, Secretary of State Thomas Jefferson, who was actually interested in surveying, was a key player in the push to create the zero meridian for the U new United States Republic to run right here. To choose the exact location of the latitudinal line, he lined up the White House front door with the Capitol Rotunda, and at the intersection, he marked with a small wooden post, now this concrete pier. So the really cool thing is this pier actually, actually predates the Washington Monument behind me. And again, most people don't even know it's here and they don't know why it's so cool. So if we follow this pier and we look north, we would see the White House. Yeah. And if we followed it and looked south, we would see the Jefferson Rotunda. So it's a pretty cool little artifact here in the, um, in the landscape. Um, and actually, there's even a place called Meridian Hill Park, which is due north of here. And like the Jefferson Pier, it was um, also a marker for surveying and longitudinal lines. So sometimes urban landscapes are a little bit like an onion, full of layers of things that have happened that you can peel back to discover important but oftentimes forgotten relics in the landscape. Now you know. And the next time you visit Washington, D.C., you better make sure that you bring your friends and family here to the Jefferson Pier and explain to them why geographers geek out on the Jefferson Pier. It will definitely impress your friends and family. So I'm standing outside the White House, and uh, what you're looking at is a lot of security. Bollards, fences, checkpoints, a variety of security apparatus. That's something else I've studied as an urban geographer, the fortressing of American cities particularly after 9-11, but even predating 9-11, a lot of cities were beginning to try and securitize what they consider important or sensitive public spaces and buildings. But as an urban geographer, I'm a little alarmed and concerned by the amount of security. Because if the national malls are staged for democracy, what do efforts to fortify and secure the White House and other federal agencies symbolize to Americans? Concerns about security of public spaces in the U.S. have seemed to preempt a conversation around access to public space. They've penetrated into the practices of our governance, our urban design, and urban planning. They've impacted the look, the feel, and the accessibility of our city spaces. In a new post-9-11 hyper-secure world, we've spent millions of dollars trying to provide the appearance of protection and security for many of our important buildings, but I really think it's impossible to do this. After 9-11, the war on terror meant that security was seen as an urgent issue. Um, and many buildings across the United States, both federal and, and municipal, were seen to be at risk or high targets for terrorism. So some of the security measures um, made since 9-11 are very visible, like these security measures like barricades and and uh, checkpoints. Some are less visible. A lot of cities have buildings with CCTV television on them. And some are temporary, like some of the double line fences that you see for certain kinds of special events. But enhanced security has impacted how we move and experience Washington DC in our nation's capital. For example, no longer can we take the candlelight tours of the White House in the evenings. And some of the areas that once were publicly accessible to visit, to take your photograph, to even picnic, 
have become inaccessible due to security fences and checkpoints. Even presidential inaugurations take place amidst an amazing amount of security, from plexiglass um, to uh, multiple dozens of Secret uh, Service agents everywhere. And even soldiers and National Guards patrol the streets of Washington, D.C. around inauguration time. As an urban geographer, I now recognize that fortification now dominates public space and a lot of urban design. And it might be at the expense of the protection of public access to symbolic meaning of landscapes. Um, so the mall in particular is really important as a site of resistance and protest and change. And what does it mean when we make the mall less accessible because of all these security measures? So I'm standing here at Black Lives Matter Plaza. Black Lives Matter Plaza is a two block long section of 16th Street uh, that goes from the White House, back of the north part of the White House, two blocks to the north. In the summer of 2020, this area was renamed by Mayor Muriel Browser and the Department of Public Works who painted the words Black Lives Matter in 35 foot yellow capital letters along with the flag of Washington, D.C. This important renaming of the street and plaza was a reaction to the growing protests after the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. In the following weeks, dozens of similar street murals were painted across cities in the United States. When announcing the renaming, Mayor Bowser said, Brianna Taylor, on your birthday, let us stand with determination. There are people who are craving to be heard and to be seen and have their humanity recognized. She noted, we had this opportunity to send the message loud and clear on a very important street in our city. Why is this street so important? In part because this segment of 16th Street includes Lafayette Park, and Lafayette Park has long served as a public gathering place for people protesting at the White House. The renaming of this street is seen by many as not only a reaction to the protest, but part of them. The Black Lives Matter movement in the summer of 2020 has been a significant reminder of urban inequality in the United States. And we know disparities play out spatially. You've learned about concepts like redlining and segregation and urban renewal, and the legacy of redlining, urban renewal in the late 1960s, and policies that have kept many blacks from owning homes and therefore segregated in some of our er in, in areas of poverty. In Washington, D.C., the majority of African-American neighborhoods have the highest rates of poverty and the lowest educational attainment rates. For many black Americans living in U.S. cities, inequality and discrimination continues to be a daily reality. As an urban geographer, I know place names and the ability to rename a place shows us the power of a person, an idea, or in this case, a movement. This is powerful geography at work. So I'm standing here in DuPont Circle, a neighborhood with an incredibly strong sense of place. In the 1960s, DuPont Circle took a central role in social change and activism for African-American civil rights, for women's equality, and to end the Vietnam War. Later, it created a foundation for Washington, D.C.'s LBGT community to claim a place in its own public life. Beginning in the 1970s, DuPont established a reputation as a major neighborhood of Washington, D.C., a safe and inclusive neighborhood. So DuPont Circle since has played a major role in all aspects of LGBT life here in D.C. It's a meeting spot, it's a place to see and be seen, it's a place of celebration, including the gay pride parades, it's home to uh, the community to gather and protest and sorrow. It has a history of being an incredibly important foundation for gay life. The neighborhood today has bookstores, bars, and bakeries, and many enduring social landmarks. It reminds us of how important a sense of place is, especially for those who have been marginalized or excluded from conventional city spaces. So this is one of my last stops. It's in southeast Washington, D.C., right along the waterfront, in a neighborhood called Navy Yard. And this is one of the most interesting neighborhoods in all of Washington, D.C., because Everything that I'm going to show you has been here for less than 10 years. It's a, a neighborhood that's been radically re transformed by waterfront redevelopment. Now, this is a common urban planning trend in many cities uh, that have been industrial and are now post-industrial. So a lot of cities in the global north, whether we're talking about the U.S. and Canada or Europe, um, cities are rediscovering and re-envisioning their waterfront. And they're doing this because of a major economic shift that occurred in the 1970s, 80s, and early 1990s. And that was deindustrialization 
and the other kinds of economic changes that made a lot of, of cities waterfront areas obsolete. So for most of US history, for example, the waterfront was really commercial and industrial. It's where factories were, warehouses and port facilities to ship goods into the global marketplace. But by the 1990s, most of these had shut down. They were obsolete. Most of the businesses um, had been shifted or outsourced to other countries. And so cities were really left with a lot of abandoned property and really prime waterfront real estate. And it took a while, but most cities have really re begun to re-envision what their waterfront should be. And one of the really interesting things that's going on with urban planning is that we see some common trends in urban waterfront redevelopment. So first is an attention on public space and creating public access for things like boating, fishing, sailing. Um, the other is to create public spaces where people can gather. So for example, I'm looking here at, um, at a big public space, not only at the width of the boardwalk, but actually also these wonderful green spaces here um, that function as an amphitheater. On a given Friday night in the summertime, there are bands that are playing live music here and people come down and picnic. So one of the things that has happened with waterfront redevelopment is cities have really reconnected people back to their water and their water access. And that's been incredibly uh, rejuvenating for many urban areas. So another theme within urban planning on the waterfront is to focus on mixed use development. Mixed use development is a term that really means that you have a mix of residential and uh, retail properties. So for example, you have restaurants and pharmacies and coffee shops at the bottom of a building, and then maybe some offices up on the second and third floors, followed by uh, apartments or condominiums up above. And what this does is it creates like a 24 hour community because you always have people, you have high density, you have people that are demanding things like um, uh, the services that retail can provide. So it's really part of the urban renaissance that's been going on in many US and European cities is this mixed use development model. And finally, cities are also really paying attention to urban sustainability. So definitely planning for and accentuating the resources like the water um, is an important part of how cities are reimagining and rethinking uh, the future of cities. So in this brief field trip, I've covered many key terms and topics from the AP Human Geography Urban Unit. It's amazing to see so many of these clearly in just one city, Washington, DC. We started our tour at the US Capitol and covered the concept of the cultural landscape. Then we moved a few hundred yards to the west and I shared with you about the power of the National Mall as one of our nation's most important public spaces for protests and for memorials. Then we stopped, because I got a little hungry, at some food trucks and I talked about how they have emerged because of some economic reasons and today they represent uh, a really interesting combination of economic and social diversity in our cities. Then I totally geeked out at the Jefferson Pier, which reminded us that there are oftentimes overlooked um, or forgotten symbols in our landscape, and we can learn a lot if we take some time to learn our history. Then I moved on to the White House, where I was definitely critical of all the fences and bollards and barriers there. And I think particularly because our nation's capital is supposed to represent freedom and openness. And so these fences and bollards seem to be at odds with those values. Black Lives Matter Plaza reminded us that we have a lasting legacy of inequality in our cities. And some of this can be traced back to geographic processes like redlining and segregation and urban renewal. Our stop at DuPont Circle, the center of gay life in Washington, DC, reminds us to focus on a sense of place and how important that can be for many communities. And finally, we ended up here in Navy Yard, my neighborhood where waterfront development has transformed this area into a vibrant mixed-use development project, and also one where we can see elements of urban sustainability planning. So while we discovered that DC has many of these urban processes happening, every city has a story, and many of these processes are happening in your hometown or your home city. Places aren't only created by planners and architects and designers, they're created by people who use these places and spaces and add to their meaning over time. Some places in our cities have very obvious and very overt and deliberate meanings, and they can represent important ideas of the time. 
Other places you have to look a little bit deeper and find those meanings and how these have played, changed over time. So I challenge you to get out and explore your own city. Keep in mind that you may not know much about your city when you start. Walking around and taking your own field trip is oftentimes just the first step. And what you observe should prompt you to investigate further in order to understand and explain what you've seen. You may need to read a book or visit the library archives or ask someone who has lived in that neighborhood a long time to share with you what they know. But get out there because all the themes I've shared with you today can be found in your own backyard. So get going.